You are listening to an interview with clinical hypnotherapist, Dr. Steve G. Jones. For a free hypnosis download, please visit stevegjones.com. Well, thank you, Bert. Good to be back. It's good to have you here, and uh, it's been a while. I know. It's been too long. We can't go this long anymore. we got to, you know, I start to miss you. Yeah, yeah, I, I like it. I think, uh, you know, when you have something to share, when you have something that's on your mind and you want to get it out there to people, I think just go for it. And that should be a, a lesson to other people who want to be become thought leaders. You know, just start leading by start sharing your thoughts. Yep, I like that a lot. And, and so right now I'm live on Facebook. So if somebody out there on Facebook land, if you have a question for Steve G. Jones, just type it in and we'll get it answered here live. So, you know, Steve, what I wanted to talk about today, unless you had a specific topic, I wanted to talk about dominating your mind. A lot of times the mind, if we don't, if we don't dominate the mind, our mind, the, the, our mind can dominate us, right? And so I want to talk about dominating your mind. And I, I'm using that because sometimes a lot of the quote problems that we are having, when I say we, you know, people in general has to do with our thoughts. I would say most of them have to do with our thoughts, how we think about ourselves and and, and, and how we are concerned about what other people think about us. And, and all of a sudden, all these thoughts start to dominate the way we think and the way we behave. And before you know it, we're depressed or we're upset. Your thoughts. I agree with that. And it's kind of ironic that people are sometimes afraid of hypnosis because they fear that the hypnotist will dominate their mind with, with negative thoughts and make them do things. But uh, what they should realize is that media, culture, uh, what their parents said to them as kids, uh, what any authority figure has said to them that they, that they took on as fact even if it wasn't, those things are already dominating their minds. And so, at least with hypnosis, what we're working toward is getting that locus of control back to the individual so that they are dominating their own mind. And the hypnotherapist is nothing more than a facilitator of that, putting those thoughts that they want to have in there. Yeah, I like that. I like that. You know what? And I want to talk about this for a little bit because a lot of people think that hypnotherapy is sometimes something, you know, a parlor trick that you see in Las Vegas. Or that hypnotherapy somehow, um, you know, that somebody can can make you do something that you don't want to do, and that's really not what not what hypnotherapy is not about, right? It's not about those things. It's really about changing the way you think about a subject matter, thinking about uh, something, that, or uh, the way you think about yourself. Give us a little insight about what hypnotherapy really is. Well, yeah, that's exactly it. And I would even say that the stage hypnosis shows that you're referencing that happen in Las Vegas and Atlantic City and on cruise ships, uh, those people are getting what they want too because they're going there with the expectation of doing silly things. So they're hypnotized. They actually are hypnotized to do those right. things. And in a clinical setting, the expectation is, hey, help me lose weight. Help me uh, make some more money. Help me get motivated. Help me become confident. So the expectation is being met there also. And to do that, in both cases, whether it's a stage show or a clinical show, we're just putting positive thoughts in their mind and using the mind's natural ability to be opened and programmed and that is made available through hypnosis we just use relaxing words get them into at least a state of alpha which is a, a relaxed state or they could go lower into theta or delta and then we're putting those thoughts there all right so talk about this real quick and then i want to get into the meat of our discussion today dominating your mind so if I want to, let's say, quit smoking or I want to improve my self-esteem, how, do, how does hypnotherapy allow me to do that and how long will it take? 
Well, when I work with someone on those things, I've I've used different protocols. For stop smoking, I use a three session protocol, which would be three weeks. And for confidence, I usually it depends, but anywhere from three to six sessions, because usually it's confidence for something else. I have to get them confident, then focus it on something else. Now, the alternative, of course, is getting a hypnosis recording, like I. As you know, I have available at stevegjones.com where it's just one session for each. In that case, you listen to that one session for three weeks in a row and that has all of the the things in there that people might encounter on their journey uh, in weight loss or in confidence. I love it. I love it. I love it. All right. So let's say that somebody is dealing with – We'll just say confidence or low self-esteem, things of that nature. They are, and you correct me if I'm wrong, they're already almost in a trance. They're putting themselves in a kind of self-hypnosis because they are repeating certain phrases, certain words over and over again. And they're kind of creating a brainwashing effect to help them create that that result of low self-esteem or that result of lack of confidence. Am I right? Yeah, you're absolutely right. And beyond that, they're using their bodies to reinforce it. I was just reading a book called Presence by Amy Cuddy, who is a, a psychologist and a professor at Harvard. And she talks about how... Yep, how we use our our bodies to reinforce how we feel. So if we feel if we don't feel empowered, if we feel a lack of confidence, we close in on ourselves. We kind of do the the turtle turtle movement, as she calls it, where we pull our shoulders up and our our head kind of sinks back into our body, and we're looking down as opposed to standing standing tall and taking up more space, like we do when we're confident. So whether we're confident or or lack confidence. We do the body length, body movements that accompany those feelings, and those body movements then reinforce those feelings in a feedback loop. So in order to break free of that, we've got to have something change. It can be our thoughts or our actions. Usually our actions dic- – usually our thoughts dictate our actions. But as Dr. Cuddy says, and I agree, our – Actions can also dictate our thoughts. So if we start sitting up, sitting up straight, taking up more room when we sit down, using our arms more to gesture when we talk, these are the things that confident people do, and then we can become more confident. But either way, we need to be we need to be aware. I that, like that. I like that. So we can go ahead. Right. So, so in other words, we can use our bodies to change the way we feel. And because we're changing the way we feel, our thoughts also change. Yeah, and a lot of and we didn't realize that until fairly recently. That's that's a, a fairly recent scientific discovery because we used to think, well, body language is of course caused by thoughts, and we didn't realize. Now it's probably been about uh, the last twenty years when I say recently, but we we recently relatively figured out that. You can move your body and affect your mind, yes. And that's very powerful, and that's good news for people who feel a lack of confidence, and they can just start you know, doing the body language of confident people, which means bigger, bigger uh, posture, taking up more space, uh, keeping your head up, keeping your back straight, you know, all the things that your grandmother might tell you. Keep your head up, <laughs> make eye contact, that kind of thing. She was right. right. She was right. So she was right. So, so let's let's talk about this. So you know, I think that um, you know today, when I say today, at present day, we hear more and more people are being prescribed antidepressants, uh, anxiety meds, and and I and I know that some people obviously do need these medicines, but I think that some people could probably get themselves off of these medicines if they just started dominating their thoughts, dominating their minds, started controlling their thoughts. Do you agree, disagree? I definitely agree. There's a, there's a curve, there's a bell-shaped curve for people who are suffering what, from what we might uh, broadly call depression. You know, some people on, on one extreme probably don't need medication and could make some uh, 
dietary changes, some sleep changes, some some behavioral changes, some thought changes, and get themselves out of it. And then at the other extreme, we have the people who, chemically speaking, they they are really uh, just out of luck. They're they're very unfortunate. Uh, it's a very extreme right. case, and the intervention of a medical professional would be would be more than justified. So I, I think as with anything, it is it is that bell-shaped curve. But for those people who who would respond well and to to something like hypnotherapy or changing their body language and don't have a severe chemical imbalance, yeah, this is uh, I, I think if we can reach out to them and say, hey, why don't you mention this to your doctor that, that you think there might be another way that you want to explore and then start exploring You are listening to an interview with clinical hypnotherapist, Dr. Steve G. Jones. For a free hypnosis download, please visit stevegjones.com. Research has shown also that there, 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 are, there are certain large population out there who are already on, on anxiety medication, and they're also doing some kind of depression medication, and they're still not feeling better. They'll feel better for the short term, but long term, they're not feeling better. They're still feeling depressed. And I have to think of, the only thing I can think of is that they're focused on those negative things that make them feel bad. And you mentioned body language. So, you know, they're walking around with low energy. Their shoulders are slumped. They're thinking, man, this is so hard. Nobody loves me. I hate my job. I hate my life. I mean, after a while, anybody would be depressed. Yeah, and then they they reinforce that, as we mentioned earlier. They by saying that, it makes it more real for them. So, uh, affirmations, as simple as that sounds, and as much as it's been beat up, affirmations I think are powerful. Now, I should mention that Dr. Cuddy actually uh, is not in favor of affirmations. Uh, and then she gives her reasoning, which I, I won't go into here. But um, one thing that I feel that I do agree with her on is the the body language affecting the mind. But I would further reason that affirmations uh, over time can also be extremely powerful. Sure, sure. Well, you know what? I think this. I think you and I both agree on this. Uh, and so I'm going to come out and say that Dr. Cuddy from Harvard is wrong on the whole affirmations thing because. I think we're, we're, we're constantly using affirmations. We may not call it that. We may call it self-talk. We may call it prayer. Yeah. We may call it, uh, what do you call it, uh, uh, incantations. But, but when you are chronically telling yourself that nobody loves me and that I can't do this and that I'm a failure, that is going to have an effect on your self-esteem, on your confidence, on your energy, on your willingness to risk uh, trying new things. Just as the opposite, if your affirmations are, I can do it, I can learn new things, I don't mind, I don't mind failing, uh, those affirmations, that kind of self-talk is going to have a positive effect on your body, on your mind. I agree. And in, in Amy's defense, even though she's, she's not here to defend herself, um, I, I, she does believe in negative affirmations, actually, that we can I, – I, I think she does from what I've read of her literature, that she, right. she thinks that uh, we can bring ourselves down by negative talk and reinforce that. Uh, it's just the positive affirmations that are in question. But, but I agree with you. Positive affirmations are every bit as real and every bit as powerful. Uh, and for a lot of people, they, they do a tremendous uh, amount of good. And they uh, br- take you from where you are to where you want to be. They, they get you there. Now, uh, again, we'll make this whole thesis about Dr. Cuddy, but she does talk about incremental, incrementally moving up uh, that way, you know, incrementally changing your thoughts and getting there. But I have seen changes. Gotcha. I have, but I've seen changes with people just that are quantum leaps that are just, that are way beyond that, where they go from one thing to another thing, almost a rags to riches quantum leap. So I believe that that is not only possible, but I, I have actually seen it. Sure. Sure. You know what? And, and, and I think there's so much research to show that, but for the way we think and the way we ourselves is really 
the, the determining factor. You look at somebody. Uh, you look at somebody like Arnold Schwarzenegger who comes to this country with, you know, no English, no money, and with you know a strange name. And you look at all the stuff that he's accomplished simply because he's got a high self-esteem. He has a high self-belief. And you know that his self-talk has got to be high as well. He's got to be sitting there uh, telling him, see, you know, uh, reinforcing his self-belief by using uh, positive reinforcement, positive self-talk, positive affirmations, whatever you want to call it. And then you have people who are born here. And they're born with parents who have money, and they're born with parents who have kids, and they can't manage their way out of a paper bag because they they lack such extreme, uh, yeah, they, they lack confidence, and it's such an extreme level of, of lacking that they don't believe they can achieve anything. Yeah, that's interesting. I mean, a lot of look at how many people. I mean, Brooklyn's no longer considered a. Um, you know, a, a kind of a dumpy place. It's considered a, a nice place now, but it used to be considered, you know, less right. than Manhattan. And look at how many people came out of Brooklyn right. who be, who became super successful. Jimmy Fallon, Jay Z, uh, my my business partner Frank Mangano. I mean, we've got a lot of people uh, who came out of there. And then uh, I used to wonder about that. Then I read the book The Millionaire Next Door, which came out quite a while ago. It came out in the '90s, actually, but. Uh, I realized how it's relevant. D- children who are the uh, the the children of of doctors and successful people often don't do very well because they're not taught the skills that it takes to to make it to get out there and make things happen. Whereas people who grow up in an impoverished environment, they're looking for that. They're looking for a way out. They're almost desperate. They want to get out of there. So it's almost a disadvantage to be born into a, a wealthy household, and sometimes it can be an advantage to be born into a not-so-wealthy house, household. So people who are listening to this and saying, well, I don't know. I don't have any resources around me. My parents don't have money. My friends don't have money. That can actually be a strong advantage for you. Well, you know what? Speaking of people from Brooklyn, uh, a couple of weeks ago, I was uh, doing a speaking engagement uh, for uh, Lou Ferrigno, right? So we got to hang out together, and Lou's uh, research, he was talking about some of the stuff that he discovered, and that he found that um, that a lot of the champion athletes that he has met had very dysfunctional relationships at home, specifically with dad. So, you know, he talked about, um, uh, well, Arnold, he talked about himself. Uh, Frank Zane, uh, uh, Ronda Rousey from the, the UFC, and, and all these other champion figures that have had a dysfunctional, if not abusive, relationship with their with their father specifically. And I thought that was interesting. So, so not only should we not give our kids a whole lot, but we should abuse them to a certain level to, to have them overachieve. <laughs> Did you just say abuse them to a certain level to have them overachieve? <laughs> that, that could yeah, be, uh, 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 you know, apparently, apparently, a, a certain amount of deprivation and abuse is good. Hey, well, you know, you're on your own with you're on your own with that one, Bert. But uh, I, I think I think to to a certain degree, uh, you are absolutely right. If you don't give them the world, if you make them work for stuff, if we're calling that abuse. And I know you have a bunch of kids and you love them and you treat them right. So I know you're just kidding. But uh, yeah, I think if we if we don't get if you don't give them everything and they've got to work for it and earn it, absolutely that sets them up for a, a lifetime of you know perseverance and, and struggling and wanting to push further and and perhaps the unfortunate situation where they have a dysfunctional relationship with uh, with their uh, father then that causes them to want to, I don't know, perhaps fill that gap. I haven't really looked into it psychologically, but right. I think there is something there. That that second part would not be something that we could or would want to cause, but for those people who have that unfortunate upbringing, it actually looks like it may be a strong advantage. Sure, sure. Uh, all right, so listen, we're out of time. I want to get out stevegjones.com. Stevegjones.com is a... Uh, the Bolt, if you will, has got the world's largest audio library of hypnotherapy uh, choices, hypnotherapy, uh, what do you call it, uh, audios. That's what I was looking for. So everything from stop smoking to losing weight to gaining self-esteem, gaining confidence, sleeping better, achieving more, 
you can find it there. I know that the stuff is there because I have used it. Uh, I, my wife and I will sometimes go to sleep listening to Steve G. Jones. And by the way, I wake up almost every day. I'm, I'm awoken. My alarm clock is a Steve G. Jones audio. And, and it just gets me going. And so I choose different audio. So 90% of the time I wake up with uh, the Steve G. Jones audio that says, I love to exercise. And so I'm usually up in the, I'm usually up and about by around 4.30, 5 o'clock in the morning. I'm in the gym. And I do love to exercise. I've loved it for years. And then one of my other favorite audios is about achieving resolutions. And that's kind of timely because it is the end of the year. And so we're all thinking about achieving our goals. So stevegjones.com is the place where you go check out. And my friend, Steve G. Jones, thank you so much for stopping by. Looking forward to having you back again sooner than later. I love it. You're listening to an interview with clinical hypnotherapist, Dr. Steve G. Jones. For a free hypnosis download, please visit stevegjones.com.